morning, so I'm waiting for my slides. So a lot of what I'm going to say is uh, be sorry. It's going to be uh, very close to what Don has said. It's no surprise. We've been collaborating for a long time, but uh, I want to give you, I mean, my own view on that. So I'm going to speak about uh, how studying complex systems has taught us that there are many surprises and pitfalls on the way from micro to macro phenomena. And in a sense, this is a crucial problem in economics, as it's a, a, a very crucial problem in, in physics too. So if we look around, I think that everybody agrees that financial markets, the economy, many social phenomena are uh, crippled by in, uh, continuous crisis, ruptures, discontinuities that resemble a lot far from equilibrium phenomena in complex systems I know. So for example, on the bottom left graph, you see uh, the amplitude of uh, daily stock market news uh, moves over the 20th century uh, in the US with the familiar spikes and clustered volatility uh, that Don just talked about in his model. And on the uh, top uh, right curve, you see uh, essentially energy dissipation in a turbulent flow with the same kind of multi-scale intermittency, because the, the little zooms you see show that the dynamics of the stock markets is, is self-similar in a sense, is the same over a, a one a century period, 10 years or a year or even a day. But what's interesting in these examples from physics like turbulence is that the exogenous drive is perfectly regular. There's no shock that you impose to the system. These shocks are self-induced and endogenous. So I think that over the last 10 years, there's been accumulating evidence for positive feedback loops and self-reflectivity. We're here to speak about that. Endogenous crisis in financial markets. Most price jumps seem to be unrelated to any news at all. Uh, volatility after jumps are very similar. The, the decay of volatility after jumps is very similar to earthquake aftershocks. There's a lot of examples like that that suggest uh, endogenous uh, dynamics. So Friedman once apparently said that market stability is, is not even an interesting question because it's absolutely obvious that markets are stable, whereas I, I believe that feedback loops and instabilities are actually everywhere. So complex systems, uh, Thomas has told you uh, about them already, but uh, it's very hard to define them a priori. It's, it's better to quote a few uh, properties of, of uh, complex systems, like the behavior of the whole is difficult to guess even if you're given all the detailed behavior of the, the parts, there's a lot of surprises from micro to macro. Interactions essentially lead to emergent new phenomena. Small causes can lead to large effects, not necessarily, but can lead to large effects. So there's a very important concept of fragility and, and cascade and avalanches. And examples that you might have a, an intuitive feel for is beat packs, where you change a single beat, beat and you can generate a system-wide avalanche, or traffic jams that seem to appear out of the blue. And last but not least, there are many equilibrium states, and not, as uh, Don was saying, not a, just a few, exponentially many in the number of, of objects, in the number of agents, or in the number of, of strategies. So it, it's, it's, you know, it, it's an extremely big number. And because of this numerous uh, um, equilibrium states, the dynamics of the system is extremely interesting. And it's actually more interesting than equilibrium itself. Because one observes slow dynamics, the system is unable to reach equilibrium in a reasonable time. And what happens is that actually it seems to settle in quasi-equilibrium states for a long time, but then suddenly chooses another equilibrium. And the transition between the two is very much like a crisis. So I don't know if you see that very well. Interactions can be good, can be bad. This is a, 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 a picture of, of thousands of starlings in the sky of Rome. So these um, pictures were made by Cavagna, uh, the Cavagna group. And you see really spectacular collective patterns. So each of these birds is, is flying really lousily. But because of their interaction, they create absolutely amazing patterns that you wouldn't guess at all uh, from the start. So let me give you a few cartoon models for these uh, collective effects and self-referential behavior. So imagine that we have to make a binary decision uh, to, to buy or to sell a cell phone, for example, or to uh, adopt uh, solar heating. Many examples of that, that kind of pay one taxes or evade taxes. And that the relative uh, benef benefit of the switch from zero to one, from not paying taxes to paying taxes, 
is composed of two terms, one which is real cost, minus alpha, and the second one which actually depends on what other people are doing. So this is beta times phi, and phi is, is a kind of survey of what other people do. It's the average of the decisions of others. So alpha is a cost, it's the real cost of adopting uh, solar heating, but beta is either you know, representing social pressure or true benefits due to reduced costs. If everybody adopts solar heating, probably the price is going to, to go down, etc. Or the increased usefulness. I'm going to speak about cell phones. At the beginning, nobody really had cell phones, so there was no real incentive to have one. But then progressively, as everybody has a cell phone, it becomes more useful to have one oneself. And so let's assume that people make choices between these two options that are in general, not necessarily rational. So uh, this is the usual way people are modeled to choose in a random situation. So there's this little parameter zeta. And the limit where zeta is 0, people choose at random, independent of, of the cost. And if zeta is infinite, then they choose the, it's the rational limit where they choose the, the less costly solution. And so this is a very well-known model. Uh, this is called the Ising model in physics. This is called the Weidlich model in, in sociology. A solution has been found by Curie and Weiss uh, uh, more than a century ago. And Brock and Dolov ha have uh, uh, explored this model in the context of economics uh, 10 years ago. And what you find are two uh, phases. One where irrationality is strong or collective effects are, are small. And then there's a unique solution where people essentially flip-flop between the two choices. But what happens interesting is that when uh, the, this parameter describing interaction, this describing imitation is strong enough, then uh, the, the, the system can choose between two equilibria. One is better than the other one. So that's this little picture of a double well potential. So you really have this mechanical analogy where you want to sit at the minimum of a potential. And uh, intuitively, so two polarized solutions appear, polarized in the sense that everybody adopts the same thing, either phi equals zero, so everybody chooses the zero option, and that's true when the costs are larger than imitation. But then, discontinuously as a function of the cost parameter, everybody should land in the, in the polarized phi equal one solution where everybody adopts the new technology. OK, well, that's well known, but actually it's not enough to understand the system because even in, if you're in a case where everybody should choose phi equal 1, but you start in a situation where nobody has chosen it, then you can compute in this model the time that the population would need to spontaneously adopt a new technology. And what you find is that this time is actually exponentially large in the number of people. So I I even if you have 1,000 people in your population, this time is, is longer than the time of the universe. So you actually will never do the transition. In, in concrete terms. So this is important because it's something that you don't see at all at the level of an equilibrium calculation. So it's, in a sense, a kind of dynamical tragedy of the commons, where everybody knows that phi equal 1 would be the optimal, but it's too costly for anybody to initiate the move for the whole population to flip. <laughs> so what's interesting is that from the physical ana analogy, you can imagine solutions to avoid being stuck in the wrong minimum. And I won't go through that, but uh, that's, I think, quite an, uh, insightful an analogy. OK, so up to now, I was imagining that all my actors in the game were homogeneous, had the same uh, preferences, if you want. But you can very easily extend the system to a much richer situation, where now we consider that individuals are all different. And so for simplicity, I'm going to stick to the fully rational limits. But you can, of course, extend to uh, the whole uh, parameter space. And here people make their choice, so the equation doesn't matter. What it means is that they make their choice not only based on public information, the cost of the cell phone or the technology level, alpha, which is the same alpha as before, not only because of social pressure, this is the beta term that I've described before as well, but on top of that, there's this psi i here, which represents the part of the utility that's idiosyncratic to each agent. And, and this, this rule, update rule of decision, is what's in physics called the random field Ising model. And it's actually amazing the number of phenomena that it's describing, even just in physics, but I think also in social science and economics. So what do you find in such a model? Well, 
So this graph, you should read it as time going from left to right and say technology level increasing, like cell phone getting better and less noisy. And the blue line is what the demand curve would be in the absence of any imitation or if imitation is weak enough. And so you see the, the blue curve is, is continuous and it means that geek people are going to adopt first and then my grandmother is going to be the last one to adopt. Uh, on the other hand, if you increase imitation beyond the critical level, there's a well-defined threshold, beta C, above which the demand curve, which is smooth otherwise, becomes discontinuous. That is, at the beginning, nobody adopts the cell phone because nobody else has adopted the, the cell phone. And then suddenly there's a runaway solution where everybody adopts the cell phone. So what's interesting is that, first of all, this is an example of a to total breakdown of the representative agent idea. And second, you have spontaneous discontinuities that come from nowhere. I mean, the underlying dynamics is totally smooth, but the system uh, uh, responds by avalanche dynamics. And, and so I've said, I've said all this. Uh, what is interesting is that around this critical level of imitation, you really find avalanche dynamics, power law, sizes, and so on. And perhaps from a kind of philosophical point of view, what's interesting too is that this critical value of, of the imitation is proportional to the heterogeneity of the population. So if you have more dispersed opinions, you stabilize the system, you avoid these, uh, these, these shift of opinions, uh, shift of uh, swigs of opinions. There's, uh, of course, another way to read this graph, which is in terms of the crisis. As, as the, the bad news, the debt piling of banks became known, people should have uh, responded you know, continuously as a function of their uh, risk aversion. But instead of this the, the euro, eu euphoric state that became self-fulfilled because of imitation led to a, a sudden discontinuity. So you can rephrase this model in various contexts. And actually, we've tested the predictions of the model, which I have no time to describe, in a case where people applaud at the end of a concert hall. And you know very well that you know, it's very embarrassing to be the same, this is the only guy to, to remain clapping after everybody else has stopped. So depending on the strength of interaction, you, you can imagine that applauses die out continuously, slowly, or abruptly if everybody else is listening to what everybody else is doing. And actually we find that in recordings of end of, of applause, and I have no time to go through that. There's a lot of applications of, the, of these ideas. For example, spontaneous evaporation of trust in the, in the network of, of banks or companies, where as a function of time, people create more and more bonds between themselves. But then, because of the default of one node, uh, there can be avalanches uh, leading to a breakdown of the whole system. And so you see the red line is the average number of bonds per node. And it in increases, so trust builds up. Business is better and better because people interact more. But then, of course, the system becomes more fragile at the same time. So there are many models of that kind. They're all roughly related to the, this random field Ising model and I refer to work by Batiston or by Alan Kerman, who's left the room, but anyway. So conclusions and lessons for agent-based modeling. Well, I'm gonna just repeat to make my point clear. Uh, many surprises on the way from micro to macro interactions can generate discontinuities at the macro level that you have no idea would exist at the micro level and even in you know, a smoothly evolving world. Uh, equilibrium analysis is not enough when can actually be dynamically stuck in the wrong minima forever or evolve in what people call a rough landscape. So I've shown you this little two uh, well potential before and it appears in a very simple model. But actually, if you look at models, more complicated models like the game model that Don talked about, actually the, the landscape has these exponential number of minima and the system is going to wander around not knowing what to do, settling in one of them for a while, looking like equilibrium, lock, looking like every, 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 uh, everything is fine, until suddenly it jumps the barrier and goes elsewhere. So I think that's quite interesting because you know, one often heard, hears that it's, it's hard to dis describe in a model evolution uh, on regime shifts, which would mean that the model has to be uh, non-stationary, the model itself. But actually in these type of, of models, you can keep the same structure and still see something that resembles a lot non-ergodicity, if you want. Uh, and then finally, in these uh, stories, in these cartoon stories, 
increased efficiency generically means more instability. So you have to choose in a sense. These systems are critically fragile to external perturbations. Think of, of my beat pack of before. And small change of parameters can completely change the, 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 the equilibrium of the system. Lo small local shocks generally trigger large systemic effects. And I think this, this is a very important lesson that these systems uh, teach us. Thank you very much.